original investigators believe he murdered her. They yeah. just can't prove it. It's my first initial call to the private investigator working on my dad's case. My wife jumps up from the table and says, Oh my God, who is this man coming in the backyard? I divorced him because I couldn't trust him at all. He lied to me at the very beginning. He was living two separate lives. In the water about 30 yards away, and identified it as it was a person. The search for a missing woman near Perdido Bay is over. A woman is dead after disappearing off a pontoon boat yesterday off of Odo Island. Authorities recovered the body of 56-year-old Carolyn Blankenfeld of Lillian this morning. Carolyn, we first reported on this drowning exactly two years ago this month. 56-year-old Carolyn Blankenfeld was found dead in the bay by the Coast Guard after spending the morning boating with her husband, Chris. Now, he told investigators his wife was swimming when she started struggling in the water, but some family members think there is more to the story. So basically, I need to take us back for a moment so we can kind of understand where this story starts. On May 6, 2018, I got a call from my mom saying that my aunt Carolyn had gone missing in a boating accident. My first question to my mom was who was on the boat with her and she said the only person on the boat with her was her husband and my uncle Chris. At that point I had a really uneasy feeling but I didn't feel like it was the time or place to express some of the uneasiness I was having around what I had just heard and also I was hopeful that Carolyn was still alive. So it wasn't until the next day that I found out that they had discovered Carolyn's body and that she had passed away. So after that, even though I w had major concerns, I wasn't that close with that side of the family. And so I just kind of put them in the back of my head and I didn't think too much more about it. It wasn't until about a year later when my cousin Bree called me. And my cousin Bree is the daughter of Chris and the stepdaughter of Carolyn. And Bree is my cousin. So my family did raise Bree for a small portion of her life. So I also kind of considered Bree my sister. So when Bree called me, I had just started the Bonsai case and we were coming back from a trip in Illinois and she called and said it was really important and to call her back. So I called back as soon as I could and I realized she had some of the same concerns that I had. And when I heard that, I thought this is definitely something I need to look into a little bit to see if there's any validity or if we're just barking up the wrong tree here. So I immediately started asking questions. I wasn't even sure if I was going to take this case yet, but I kind of wanted to know more about what had occurred here. Hello. Hey. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Pretty good, just got home from work. Nice. Okay. So I was like reading, I, I have like a lot of notes on this because like I said, I've been obsessed with it since it happened. Yeah. But I have like sort of messages that I exchanged with some of the neighbors that lived near them and hung out with them like daily. Okay. We were at Joni's and Carolyn came around the corner alone sobbing and motioned for me to come over. I walked over and she collapsed in my arms and said, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I thought you and Buddy were against me, but it was Chris. I love you, I'm so sorry. I assured her it was okay and all and I loved her too and asked her what was going on. She said she would explain when she had herself more together but that she and Chris had decided to separate at the end of the month and it would be. The next day or so we got a text to do Scotch 30th. They acted as if they were really in love again and we were getting ready to leave. She hugged me and said she would love to go to dinner with Jenny and I for Mother's Day and that she'd fill me in on everything that the next day, when they did not show up to Scotch 30, Keith texted Chris and asked where they were. Chris said they were on the boat and taking some time, just the two of them. This is the day that the accident happened. Okay. 
and then Chris sent pics of them both on the boat to Keith, which is also weird. Please do you know that they have the pics off of Keith's phone and the text messages and the time they were sent. Wow, that's um, crazy. How how do you know how far after they were sent after the accident? Keith got the pictures of Dad and Carolyn out on the boat at 4:15 p.m. On the news reports, it says that she went missing at 3 p.m. Interesting. And what time was your dad found? Or did he come up to shore? I, I know that he was found behind someone's house. I just, I, I need to go back and read the news reports. Okay. Uh, I also have the phone number of the officer who came after Carolyn died. Weird stuff was happening after she died, too. There's, like, a little girl that lives in the neighborhood as well. My dad basically, like, freaked out on her because of something she said. He went on a rant about, like, all the stuff Carolyn did wrong and how she had a boyfriend. So he found out about after the fact and that she had a date on the calendar where he assumed she was following for divorce. All this was supposedly learned after she died and her stuff wasn't going well. I just like, I feel like there's some type of motive there. Did he ever tell you what exactly happened that day? He told me that Carolyn was swimming and that the waves were getting too harsh. And that she started floating away from the boat and he jumped out of the boat to save her and then the boat started floating away. My dad's phone and wallet were also found on the boat too. So do you know how long that he was in the water for? All of this started around 3 p.m. that day when they found the boat. There's two articles it says 5 p.m. or 7 p.m. they found the boat around that time. It was near someone's like dock. Okay. Uh, my dad was found at 7.20 p.m that Sunday, and Carolyn's body was found Monday morning at 8.55 a.m. Okay. On like the opposite end of where he was found. This Gambia County Search and Rescue Coast Guard team found Carolyn. Investigators telling us, according to Blankenfell's husband, his wife was swimming Sunday afternoon in the bay when she suddenly began to struggle in the water. He told them he jumped in from the boat they were in to try to help her, but lost sight of her. The boat drifted away, forcing him to swim to shore for help. It was found later beached on Ono Island. And when they found her, was there an autopsy done on her? Did you ever see anything like that? I didn't see anything pertaining to that, like, paperwork-wise. They cremated her really fast. Uh, she still had some of her jewelry on and stuff like that, and they gave it to him, and they cremated her body. Do you know how far away from where the boat was found he came out of the water? Okay, look up inner rarity point. Okay. That's where the boat was found. Okay. And then where was he? Uh, Bob O'Link Road in Pensacola. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh she, my God. Right? I think one of the very first things is the shock and, and surprise that I felt when I found out how close Chris was to where the boat came out of the water and even to where Carolyn came out of the water. When you look at a map, they all came out of the water only a mile and a half from one another. Carolyn on one end of that, the boat three quarters of a mile from her, and then Chris three quarters of a mile from the boat, all coming up along the same shoreline. So I think that really was one of the first things that grabbed my attention about this case, but it definitely was not the last. And when they found her, was she out further in the water or was she washed up on shore? I'm like 100% positive she was up on shore. I, I don't know, when I heard about it, I was thinking they were way further out, out in the water. Did he say how far out? Honestly, Ash, they couldn't have been out very far because from where they lived, uh, that's where they usually take off from, you can see the other side of the land, I guess, and I would say it was like two or three miles across all the way from where they lived. I have the name of the family who found the boat. And the... The dogs and the cell phone and the wallet were all on the boat still. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. And when the family found the boat, what made them think no one was on it? Just because it was like washed up on shore? Or? Yeah, they just they saw it like floating by their pier and they heard the dogs barking. I, I know they called the police. Called the police, okay. So that, yeah, they, they found this boat and they found a man's wallet and cell phone on it and dogs. 
And then, like, a couple hours after they found the boat, my dad washed up. When we say washed up, you say some people found him in the backyard. Did they actually see him wash up, or did they all of a sudden just have a man in their backyard? They had a man in their backyard. Okay. And I'm assuming their backyard backs up to the water because of where it is or is close to it? Yeah, I'm assuming so. Okay. Because I know he, like, went to the residence and whatever, they saw him walking up, and he told him what was wrong, and I guess they got him to the hospital, something like that. Like I said, he was in the Coast Guard. I feel like if you were in the Coast Guard for so long and that it was your job to search and rescue and rescue people out of the water, you would jump back into your old ways, like your adrenaline would kick in and you'd be able to fucking do that somehow. But, I mean, I could be wrong. And when you said you went on boat rides with them, how many times had you been on rides with them? I went, like, three or four times. I had lived great down the road from them for a while, and they, I've never known them to not put an anchor down if they were stopped. And did you guys, did were you ever on the boat when they went swimming out there? Yeah, but it was always, like, parked at, like, a beach. Like, they had the boat parked by a beach, and we'd swim right there. I've never known them to, like, swim in the middle of open water. <laughs> yeah, that seems like, I don't know, I just, maybe I'm terrified of water, but that, that seems so brave to me, to be out in open water taking a swim. <laughs> yeah. So he said that she just jumped off, went for a swim, got in trouble out there, and he just jumped in after her. That's what he told you? Yes. Well, he ended up sending an email to all of his kids, and I could read it to you if you'd like, if it would help you understand a little bit better. Yeah, if you don't mind. See something, this November 28, uh, 2018. Okay. He says, hey, kiddos, I hope you're all doing well. I miss you all terribly, and I hope you all know this. Annie told me that I have to tell you guys this, and rather than telling each of you individually, I'm telling you this way. 205 days ago was hard, so hard for all of us. I have been essentially crushed, absolutely haunted since then. I know all of you are having the same hard time. I'm forever so, so sorry. Up until just recently, I didn't want to go on. I'm seeing a counselor. I've had some medical behavior things going on since the day in the water with mom. I'm dizzy a lot, sometimes so dizzy I throw up or fall down. Standing from sitting or laying down is worse. Getting lost driving home, so lost I have to GPS myself home. Lots of pressure in my head between my eyes. Went to an ENT. He said that everything was clear. I can't concentrate. Work things are taking so much longer. Short-term memory is almost completely shot. If I don't write it down or do it immediately, I'll probably forget. I'm very, very impulsive here at that in all, all capitals. I sold absolutely everything, which wish I had it. I bought a house in Wisconsin that I never intended on going to. I intend on selling it when I have about 100k equity in it. I went and had an MRI done a few weeks ago because I wanted to see what the F was going on. I thought I had brain cancer. My therapist thought it was depression or grief. As it turns out, the day in the water, I apparently had a stroke in my frontal lobe. When my lungs collapsed, shush, and adrenaline started spiking, the doctor thinks that apparently caused it. The doctor also told me that the things I am experiencing may be my new normal. Only time will tell. Only recently have I started to feel a bit better. I have been dating only one person. I don't know if you guys want to hear that, but it is what it is. She makes me feel better and not so alone. She is almost 39 and has three kids. Um, she has her own house in Mobile, but her kids and her stay with me almost constantly. It keeps my mind occupied. I hope you kids are okay with everything. If I'm weird on or distant on the phone, it's because I'm trying to deal with things. I love you all. I hope that you all still love me the same. Wow. And that's the, that's the last time I ever heard about a stroke. I've never heard him talk about it ever again. Wow, that's interesting. So that was the the main medical thing that happened to him his his lungs collapsed. Yeah. And how long was he in the hospital for after? A day and a half. And when the collapsed lung thing, is that something your dad told you or was something that obviously was happening from the hospital staff? It was in the email. I mean, I feel like he was only in the hospital just because he was in the water so long. Like, they didn't seem to do anything special for him. They didn't make anything seem like a big deal while he was there. So did you ever hear a doctor or anyone say that the lungs were collapsed, or he just said that in an email to you? He just said it in an email. Okay, so in May, when you went to the hospital, you personally didn't... Is, see any evidence or hear anything there of anyone saying he had a collapsed lung and it wasn't until November that that's when he finally told you that. Correct. 
So do you think that that could have been a possibility that he did have collapsed lungs or just from like, I know you're not a doctor, but just from like looking at it, do you think that that's even a possibility? I mean, if it's something that could happen over time, possibly. It sounds weird. I feel like that would be really severe to have a collapsed lung, but maybe I don't understand it. Like I have to ask somebody about this now. Yeah, because he was only there for a day and a half. I feel like if he had a collapsed lung, he would have to be there longer. He would have to be, like, monitored, you know? I would think. Like, I think he'd be on a ventilator or something. God, I think that's really telling, though. I feel like it'd be interesting to see Chris's medical <laughs> reports. I mean, I know those are probably impossible to get, but after he got out of the hospital, because I feel like that would tell a lot, you know? Yeah, he was at West Florida Hospital. That helps. And how long after this happened did you see your dad? I stayed with him for a week and a half after this accident happened. And, and I did not see him, see him again until December, uh, like the week of Christmas 2018. Okay, and at what time of night did you get to the hospital? The day after it happened, I got there like 4 p.m. The day after I got there, they released him like in the morning, and I went and picked him up. Okay, and then when you saw him, did he look to you like pale or sick? No. Did he, while you were there, talk about having like IVs in or a respirator or anything? He said that he was having trouble breathing just because he aspirated so much water. So they had him on some type of breathing machine, which I have to be on sometimes just because of asthma. But I mean, it didn't seem like anything too extreme and the IV seemed normal just to get his fluids back up to check. He did cry when I first got there. He just like said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And then... As time went on, he just, like, was joking about stuff and, like, changing the subject about everything. I felt so uneasy. Like, I just didn't feel yeah. right. Yeah, I think that's really telling when you just kind of feel it, especially that's not something you would just normally think. In your opinion, how was their marriage? It sounds like it was kind of rocky. Yeah, there was a lot of problems towards the end. Probably, like, the last five years, maybe more, I don't know. But they just didn't need to be together anymore and it kind of just went on for too long and things got worse and worse as it seemed. Do you know what kind of insurance payout Chris got? His boss from Austell was in there in the hospital room talking to him about it like not even a day after it happened and I was just like come on dude. I mean maybe like he did show up to check on them and he brought it up but I don't feel like he would bring it up that soon unless my dad asked him to. Yeah, that seems really weird. Chris had a life insurance policy through his company on her? Yes. Okay. Is that the only life insurance policy that you know of? Yeah, that's the only one I know about. Okay. How long from when Carolyn passed did he buy the house in Wisconsin, did you say? I want to say like six, five or six months after that, and then he started dating that girl seven months after. Wow, that's so crazy. So he bought a house in Wisconsin and then resold it again, basically? He still owns it. He's just waiting for, like, the equity to build up or something like that. Okay, okay. So then he bought the house in Mobile, and he now lives there with the new lady. Uh, Sarah. Sarah, yeah, okay. and her kids. And they've known each other through work. Yeah. She has a 15-year-old boy, an 11-year-old daughter, and, like, a newborn baby. Not even, like, seven months after she died, he was already dating this girl, Sarah. And what, when's the last time you saw him? Because that's Carolyn, the anniversary of that was like a month ago, right? Mm hmm So she's only been gone for about a year and a month, right? Yeah, he's already engaged too, by the way. Right. I went to dinner with him and he told me and I was just like, what? <laughs> yeah. And did he tell you, doing it? was it just the two of you or did he tell you with her right there? Sarah. He told me with her right there and her children right there and my girlfriend right there. And he said, why don't you congratulate her? So what did you say? Did you just say congratulations or? Yeah, I said congratulations and then I left. <laughs> She's like probably eight or nine years older than me. My girlfriend has like never met my dad before and she's never met Sarah before and she just like hated the whole entire thing and said she felt uncomfortable the whole entire time. So here's the point where I break into the episode and just kind of give you guys a couple updates. The first one is I want to thank all the new viewers who are watching What Happened to Carolyn. Some of you might not have been following along with the Bonsai case. So if you do have some time, I would go back and watch that case. It's getting very interesting and we still have more episodes coming out. That releases every other Monday. 
The Carolyn story will release every other Friday, so you can keep up with that. The show will always be free to the public. That's how we get our information and our tips in and are able to produce more episodes to hopefully find the truth in these cases. But if you do feel like you want to help support what I'm doing, I would really appreciate it. It's real easy to do. You can subscribe on the website. And please understand, I know how sometimes it feels when I ask for people to subscribe, but that money does just help us. It goes right back into these cases. It helps us look into them. It helps with travel costs and stuff like that. We're not making any money on the show. Those subscription fees just really help us continue to do this work. Now, if you do subscribe, though, you do get to see episodes a week early or three days early, depending on your subscription level. You do get discounts on merchandise, and you do get to be part of a private Facebook group that we've set up that we do Q&As, uncut footage, behind-the-scenes footage, and just special things for people who choose to subscribe. Our goal is to try to find truth in these cases, so if you feel like you want to support us on that, we would really appreciate that. Now, back to episode one of season two, What Happened to Carolyn Blankenfeld. I definitely need to put some thought into this, but, you know, I mean, obviously when we do these kind of stories, everything kind of ends up going out into the open. Is that, yeah, I know. Is that something you're comfortable with, or...? Um, I honestly feel like it wouldn't be a big loss to lose my dad. Yeah, yeah, because I feel like that's, there's going to be, like, a huge backlash from it, and I just want to make sure that you're okay yeah. with that because I don't want to start down a road that you're not prepared for because I feel like it's going to probably piss family members off and th I think there'll just be a backlash from it overall. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely am. I, yeah, no, no, I definitely am because I feel like there's something really wrong here, you know? Um, I have a list of like at least 16 people that would be willing to like give us some sort of statement. Do you think that you can get me the investigator's number and Buddy's number so that I can talk to them? Yeah, Buddy Miller is absolutely the number one person that I want you to talk to if you do end up calling him. Okay. Um, it was Carolyn's best friend. They've been best friends for six years and my dad was like always jealous of their friendship. I actually talked to him about this and he said that he would do anything to help. Well, he hung out with them a lot, pretty much every day. He knew a lot about their personal lives. He took care of their pets when they were out of town. He probably knows a lot more than I do. Okay, perfect. Let me call these two and let me kind of get my feet under me on some of this. And you think they're going to be okay with me calling both of them? Yes, uh, Buddy 100% knows about this. So okay. I already told him to be prepared. And the investigator, I... I've never personally talked to him, but I know that he's been in contact with Buddy, and he just hasn't made any headway towards the case in a while, so that's why I feel like I don't know if it's closed or not. Okay, yeah, so let me, I'll call these guys Monday then. We won't start anything or proceed with anything until we talk after that, and then okay. I'll text you, and then we'll set up another time to talk, and then we'll figure out if we're going to do this. All right. Okay. <laughs> Buddy? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're kind of breaking up, but I hear you. Yeah. Uh, I, can, I can hear you now. Oh, okay, cool. Perfect. <laughs> it sounded like Bree had talked to you a little bit. Yeah, I, I had felt that's what had happened uh, within a couple of days. But it took me a little while before I went to the investigators and talked to them, see what they were doing about it. And they asked me why I came over, you know, why I came forward. And I said, because nothing adds up. And I said, that's our thoughts on it too, not a thing adds up. And I tried to stay out of it because it's not my dad and it's not my life. And I obviously love Bree deeply. I would never want to hurt her out of everybody. Um, I understand completely. I love Marie just beyond belief, and uh, we've always been fairly close. And, and I know Carolyn was uh, a big influence in uh, Bree's life. Absolutely. I feel like we're going to do this case, but I also tread lightly in the beginning to make sure I have the right pieces in place. The investigators have told me to uh, treat Chris like I always have. You know, as a friend. Yeah. 
and I've managed to do that so far. Wow, that's course, a tough place to be. Well, since he moved from over here, he got rid of everything that was Carolyn. Yeah. He tried to grind her tattoo off his shoulder, you know, with her name. I bought her motorcycle from him because she loved that motorcycle. She and I, we did a lot of riding together on it, cross country and everything else. And he got rid of everything that had anything to do with Carolyn. Yeah, I thought that some of the stuff post, which I don't try to predict on how people should grieve, but I did think some of the things that happened post the death, I can't imagine watching a spouse or a friend or anyone pass away in that manner and then moving on with your life so fast. I feel like that would destroy most people. So it was kind of surprising as information came in about him selling her stuff, him buying homes. That yeah, seemed yeah. really concerning because my understanding is not only did he buy a home in Mobile, which he's moved in with a woman now, but there was yeah, a woman yeah. in Wisconsin, it sounded like, almost immediately following Carolyn's death. Right, right. That was within uh, probably three months. Yeah. His death. And the woman he's with now, uh, Brie told me they're engaged and there's three kids and one of them's a baby. Yeah. Did we know how old the baby is? It was one you just carried around. He actually made the statement why he was hoping that child to breathe that he felt like this was Carolyn reincarnating. Jesus. And, uh, there's some other strange actions. I was at the emergency room the night it happened. And then I went over to the hospital uh, when they transferred him to the hospital. But I, I, I was... Well, it, it's hard to explain. Because, well, first of all, you need to know that Carolyn and I loved each other deeply. Yeah. And we had actually been together for over seven years. Oh, wow. So you actually lost someone. Yeah, that, wow. I, I lost the love of my life. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I, I knew you guys were friends. I didn't realize that, though. I'm very sorry. And, well, I wouldn't let her leave her him. Or I told her, but first she didn't leave him, and two, it was completely about him and not about she and I. Yeah. And the week that this did happen, and I had told her when she felt it was time, she didn't have to say nothing, just show up, and we'd be there. Yeah. And she had told my neighbor uh, that she and Chris had talked, and they were going to separate at the end of the month. And she said, I want to tell you this first because I'll be living with Buddy next door to y'all. So they were planning on going separate ways. And Chris, man, all the time I knew him and he'd get mad at Carolyn and all this, it wasn't about losing her. It was about what he would lose if he got divorced. I, I just, this has almost killed me. Yeah, I could see why. I mean, I can't imagine living with this. And he yelled during a memorial service every time uh, one of our neighbors would come in, he would take them in the back bedroom and tell them what happened. But we've got four different stories of what happened now. The one he told me in the hospital was Carolyn was swimming and got in trouble, and he dove in to get her, and the boat drifted away, and he told her and he'd go get the boat. She didn't want him to leave her. He told me I swam for hours. This is on Fernando Bay. Carolyn and I have been really good friends. And I was with Chris then before our relationship started. Yeah. And I got run down by a uh, guy texting in his car on my motorcycle. Oh. And uh, it made me up pretty bad. And it, when we got together, she told me that was the reason because she realized he had very serious feelings for me. Yeah. And uh, so basically that's what brought us together. You know, like I said, over seven years, you know, and I'm, I'm just grateful God let us have that time. And I, I talk to her every day. Wow. So I, I guess it probably sounds like I'm a little bit crazy myself and I probably am. But, uh, I think I'd be a little bit crazy if I lost the love of my life too so I don't think you sound crazy at all. 
Man, she was. I have never used that phrase in my life. So, at any point, I will do anything I can to help you with this project. Okay. Hey, Bree, this is Ash. I said I'd give you a call after I talked to Buddy and the investigator, and I am interested in looking into this case more. I definitely think we need to do a little more digging before I 100% commit, but I think the first step is to get you on an airplane out to New Jersey so that we can really try to set up a timeline here and interview you to see if we can take the next steps and then head down to Florida. So let me know if you're available and give me a call back when you get this.